the conversation is precisely what you'd expect it to be. It's a little bit strained, um, sometimes extremely strained because there are different groups with very different opinions where there are pretty uh, well, uh, well developed passions and where it's painful to watch people or it's difficult for people to say what they're really thinking without offending others. They don't necessarily want to offend others. And this is true on both sides. People who are sort of ardently Zionist, uh, defending much of what Israel has done, or people who are ardently pro-Palestinian, uh, or people who are sort of in the middle and trying to navigate that terrain all find it difficult to talk about without people being hurt or offended or, or upset. I mean, here I think I've... I... I've taken advantage of the academic freedom that exists, and I, I've definitely taken full advantage of that. And um, I, I, I've faced a lot of pressure, whether it's from the administration or from my fellow students. You're kind of looked at as you know, a troublemaker. You're rocking the boat too much. You're stirring controversy. But I'm not afraid of doing that, because I think that it's important, um, especially also because I'm the only Palestinian student at the Kennedy School out of almost 1,000 students. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if I don't speak up, then no one will really hear that perspective. What tends to divide a lot of times the, the student body them, itself is uh, professors who, you know, polarize the situation. If, if, if we had Chomsky on campus, I'd, I mean, I can see how, you know, the student body um, would be completely divided. And even now with, with the presence of Dershowitz, who's doing, um, you know, a great job as an advocate for Israel, I see how Palestinian or pro-Palestinian activists um, here on campus feel intimidated. So, so I actually see it coming from above, this, this sort of this uh, separation or this polarization, uh, rather than from, from the grassroots. People who do teach on the Middle East face a lot of pressures, um, you know, academic freedom. Now, it's a very precarious position to be in to have to teach Middle East politics. And if you look at, like, the case of Professor Joseph Masad at Columbia University, where he was intimidated and all these false accusations were waged against him, and Tony Jewett at, um, at New York University, all these <coughs> academics who are, you know, they really have to think twice before they speak up because of the repercussions. There is an implicit understanding in a lot of places of what you're allowed to say and not allowed to say. And that, of course, exists at the Kennedy School, especially even in any type of public environment, what type of question somebody asks. You don't want to be painted, you know, with the brush as being an extremist. I mean, here you have a lot of events on the war on terrorism. If you're critical of that, if you're critical of U.S. policy, you know, are you kind of siding with, there's an implicit understanding, maybe you're siding with the, the enemy. I mean, you almost have to give caveats to every question you ask. Well, of course, I don't support terrorism, but... I know that the campuses in the States have been kind of a battlefield for the last few years, um, since this second intifada started. Uh, I would imagine that some people are kind of desperate, and they just really, some people just don't believe that anything can be changed. I guess people from like Jewish Jewish students or pro-Israeli students, I guess some of them are just like um, they know that that when you talk to to a Palestinian or a pro-Palestinian um, student, they're gonna, gonna they will make their case in a very very tough way, and maybe a very provocative way, um, and and it's harder to defend the Israeli cause, you know. Um, which we can, I can, we can, def we can defend it. We can talk about it. We can discuss it. It's just that Israel, you know, we are a more open society. I think of all the issues on on uh, on campus or in the academic community, the issue of Israel is the largest taboo in terms of the extent of what you're allowed to say. And there are a lot of people who are critical of Israeli policies and the, the policies of the Israeli government. And uh, but it's very very difficult to also sometimes draw the line of where, you know, and, and, and see where, where do you cross the border between being just anti-Israel or anti-Israeli policies and then become anti-Semitic. Right. I think it's, for some reason, this conflict in general just, just takes from people <laughs> their most, like, basic senses. It gets people just going crazy. Um, whenever you hear a speaker, I remember hearing, like, an Israeli speaker who came here, like, three years ago. 
And he was talking all about democracy, blah, 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 all this beautiful, fluffy language. And someone asked about Israel, and everything he said about democracy just went out the window. And he just sort of said, and it, it was just this sort of gut clenching up, defensive, we must defend ourselves, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's totally legit, um, but for some reason, the discourse when it comes to this conflict gets to be totally emotional and gut and not really that logical and strategic. Uh, the real enemy is uh, that whole tendency that we all have to jump in and try and want to have a kind of a kindergarten argument uh, where you can shout and maybe punch each other a little bit and stuff like that. Uh, and that is, on the long run, very counterproductive. Now on radio is that a claim that Mr. Finkelstein made available to me certain charts? No, that I is never a said that. No. Okay, okay, Mr. Dershowitz. Is it a correct quote? quote? Let me is, finish, Mr. No, no, Dershowitz. No, no, make, I want to ask we you a question. A is it a direct? Is it an I'm, accurate okay. quote of Twain? Did Twain say uh, what Professor I Dershowitz. quote him? Please read what he wrote. If I have the whole book, I will find for no, you, you if you want to take time, Norm Finkelstein, that can you, if you want the, the 3,000 uh, people I read during this phase. Don't change uh, the subject, that's Mr. Not Dershowitz. The subject. Changing the subject. We're I talking argue about that phase two. 700,000 Arabs, don't play this game. Arabs refers either to a sub-phase no. or is a typographical error. This is why lawyers have a bad reputation. Because you're playing Me, a game now. Israeli, I belong Mr. to the So, so don't but, characterize okay, my views. Mr. You don't Dershowitz, know my views. I read your book or the book you purport well, to have written. Right, right, right. Uh, now, now you're claiming somebody else uh, wrote it. I hope so. <laughs> For your sake, yeah. I truly I hope you did not write book. that book. I proudly read. And and a lot of people are inflammatory, and that's the nature of the discourse. It isn't to make. Uh, uh, or to draw to some type of constructive conclusion. It isn't even to convince you, is to put as many things to kind of fire you up, even to your own people, to kind of put it out there, being like, I have my, you know, place on the table. You know, I'm saying my bit, I'm representing, you know, my side. It's not even about coming to any type of positive conclusion. The more negative side have been the sort of watchdog efforts. Uh, groups like Camera and Campus Watch of sort of trying to get students to serve as as watchdogs and and uh, informers is the wrong word but to, to report faculty who are critical of Israel and you know put them up on websites and it's a, a subtle form of blacklisting uh, and again designed to intimidate 